<laughs> oh, hello, everyone. Um, I see people are trickling in. So we'll be starting in about five minutes. Um, Okay, we'll be we'll be starting in about one minute. Okay, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, today's seminar is going to last for about one hour. Um, I'm going to start with a brief introduction to what this company is, RealityEngines.ai, um, and what we do. And then I'll dive into the technical aspect of my talk, which is called Introduction to Apply Deep Reinforcement Learning. I'll be talking for about 30 minutes, more or less. Um, and then Mark will take over. Um, uh, with a seminar on self-supervised learning. Um, so what is RealityEngines.ai? RealityEngines.ai is a cloud AI service that automatically trains and deploys custom deep learning models for a variety of use cases. Um, so if you have data that matches any of these use cases that fall into AI for IT operations, fraud and security, forecasting, recommender systems, um, RealityEngines.ai takes care of sort of the uh, model training and deployment process end to end. Um, so you can just upload your data um, and our service will find uh, the right model uh, parameters to train um, and then enables you to deploy your, your product immediately. Um, With that being said, um, we'll dive right into the technical topic, which is introduction to applied deep reinforcement learning. Um, I hope you're all safe um, and cozy in your homes watching this. Um, this is a bit of a mouthful, just the title is <laughs> pretty long. So we're gonna go ahead and break down each of the components that go into the title. Um, so introduction to applied deep reinforcement learning has a deep learning component, a reinforcement learning and component, and an applied component. Um, deep learning, as, uh, you know, a, a short and sweet definition of deep learning is it's the end-to-end -end learning of complex representations through multi-layer models. Um, so we stack a bunch of neural network model, uh, neural network layers, and um, that successively uh, learn more complex representations of the data. Um, Reinforcement learning is learning to make sequential decisions to maximize rewards given by the environment. Um, and so in reinforcement learning, we have an agent who lives in a certain environment and they interact with their environment by taking certain actions. And based on their actions, the environment returns a certain reward. And then the, uh, the agent has to somehow modify the actions that they take based on the response from the environment. Um, that's sort of the summary of reinforcement learning. And then the main angle of this talk is the applied aspect of reinforcement learning. Um, deep reinforcement learning is a very uh, application centric field, even though it has a vast sort of landscape of, the of theory and in the literature. Um, it's, in, it's in its origin, it's driven by application and 
So the classic sort of applications have been in games. So things like Atari games, that was one of the first papers that ever used reinforcement learning, um, where they trained an agent that could play and win Atari games. Um, you might have heard in 2016 about AlphaGo, which beat the world champion in Go uh, using deep, uh, deep RL techniques. Um, deep RL is also used in control settings to help uh, you know, robotic arms in factories um, and for, you know, for robotics motion planning and interaction with the environment. It's also used in recommender systems. Um, so those are a few of the applications. Um, and we're going to keep coming back to how RL is applied throughout this talk um, and sort of present the algorithms um, in relation to their application in the real world. Um, so this will be sort of the structure of the, of the presentation for the next 35 minutes. I'm going to speak briefly about um, the motivation for the, for the field. Um, why do we do reinforcement learning in the first place? Why is it so compelling? What are the driving questions behind it? Um, I'll talk about what reinforcement learning is and sort of the, the, the mathematical formalism behind it um, and a, bit, a brief overview of the basic principles that go into it. And then I'm going to talk about why deep reinforcement learning. So we know what reinforcement learning is. We know how it's successful. We know what deep learning is. Why are we combining those seemingly different learning paradigms into, into this thing called deep reinforcement learning? Um, so I'll speak briefly about that. And then in the second half of the presentation, I'll talk about algorithms and their applications. Um, so I'll talk about the different types of RL algorithms that have been studied. And I'll go over two brief case studies um, about practical applications and the way that uh, RL has been applied. Um, and I'll speak about the algorithms that went into uh, those applications. Um, so let's get started. Why reinforcement learning? Why is this? Well, um, why do we even study this field? Um, and a very short answer uh, is actually us. Um, humans are very intelligent creatures. We learn how to walk and talk from a very early age um, during, during our infancy. Uh, when we're adults, we learn how to drive. All throughout school and college, we learn about various abstract concepts. We can learn how to play instruments. We learn how to play sports, you know, so we can use our, we can use our brain. We're very dexterous with our hands. Um, we're very good at processing sensory information. Um, we can learn by ourselves. So we can sort of just learn from our ambient environment by taking in visual input, sound input, um, and forming representations of the world. And we can also learn from other people, but whether by copying other people or by um, uh, being directly taught by them. So we're really, really good at learning. Uh, our human brain is sort of, you could say, is wired for learning. Um, and in fact, it's so good at learning that it can even learn to rewire itself. So a classic example of that is neuroplasticity. Um, this gentleman on the bike is part of an experiment demonstrating neuroplasticity. Um, he's actually wearing goggles that flip the world upside down. So he sees the entire world flipped. Um, but after a few days of wearing those goggles, he actually learns to see his mind readjust or his brain readjusts the image so that he can act in the world as if he were seeing it uh, right side up. Um, I don't know how, if this would pass safety regulations today, but um, this, this is a testament to how good our brain is at uh, you know, uh, learning and adapting to new environments. Um, Human children are actually really good at learning. Um, I don't know if you can hear the sound, but this is an example of little kids learning not only from copying other people, but they can actually help adjust. They can help, oops, sorry. They can help the adult achieve his, ta they like learn so well that they can help ad the adult achieve his task. Um, when he fails to do so. Um, chimpanzees are also pretty similar to humans. They're really good at learning. Uh, 
Um, so humans are really the, the gold standard when it comes to learning and intelligence. And this is really what we seek to mimic in reinforcement learning. Um, so the driving question in reinforcement learning is how do we build intelligent systems? And inspired by how human behavior and human intelligence, uh, the premise is that intelligence hinges on the ability to learn. Um, and so this takes us to what reinforcement learning is. And what it is, is it's a generalized learning framework. We seek to capture this sort of versatility um, and learning ability. And we want to find an appropriate sort of mathematical formalism that captures this versatility. Um, we want to find a framework that helps us have a different variety of algorithms that allow us to mimic all these types of learning where you can learn by yourself, you can learn by uh, processing sensory input, or you can be, or you can learn by uh, being taught by others. So reinforcement learning is a generalized learning framework is how I would describe it. Um, so how do we do that? How do we accomplish this level of generality? Um, and so the main formalism involved in reinforcement learning is what's called a Markov decision process. And we're going to dive a little bit into the math of RL here. Um, a Markov decision pro in, so in RL, we have an agent interacting with an environment. Um, you know, the, uh, the agent takes an action and the environment responds to the agent. And we represent the environment by these following sets or functions. Um, the environment consists of a set of states, S. Um, those could, and we're going to go into example of these in a bit, but it's, so a set of states. So we have four states in this little image, for example. Um, we have a set of actions you could take for, based on each state. So from S0, we can take an action that takes us to S1. Um, so we have a set of actions associated with each state. Um, we have a set of rewards based on a state and an action. So for each state action pair, we for each state action pair, we the environment presents us with a reward. Um, and finally, there's a transition function, meaning this environment is stochastic. It's not entirely deterministic. Um, so for each pair of actions, if the agent is in state S and they take action A, there is a given probability that they arrive at state S prime. And so this stochasticity is captured by the transition function, where um, uh, where it specifies a distribution over what states you're likely to get into by performing a certain action starting from a given state. Um, and so as you can see, this is a very sort of abstract and general definition. And this is what, on the one hand, gives RL its sort of generality. Um, but on the other hand, it's what makes it a bit intractable and um, a bit hard to apply or model different situations. Um, so given this formalism, the goal of a reinforcement learning agent is to find what is called a policy that maximizes their lifetime reward. Um, and so a policy is just a specification of what action the agent, this is or sort of a blueprint for what, what actions the agent should take at each state. Um, so the agent wants to figure out for itself um, of how to maximize the, the reward uh, it gets over its lifetime by taking multiple actions. Um, and so if, if we parameterize the policy by this argument theta, um, the goal of reinforcement learning is to find the best theta that will maximize the expected reward because the environment is stochastic. So it's what maximizes the expected reward um, at every time step of interacting with the environment. Um, and yeah, feel free to ask some questions in the chat window. Um, I'll be looking at them every once in a while and try to respond as best as I can. Um, so given this goal, we want to figure out 
how to find this policy. How, how do we find a policy that maximizes the lifetime reward? And there's a vast literature and uh, a large variety of, of algorithms that we can use, um, but they all have this sort of shared anatomy of just a three-step cycle, where in the first step, we generate a number of samples, or in other words, we run the policy. So if I'm an action, if, I, if I'm an agent in an environment, um, and I have a certain policy, I just follow that policy. I I perform my action. I see what reward the the environment provides me with, and from there I can fit a model to estimate the reward. Um, once I have sort of an estimate of the reward, I can then improve my policy. Um, and this might sound a bit familiar because this is how humans tend to make decisions in the way they navigate the world. We go into the world, we take some actions, we receive some feedback from some feedback from our environment, and based on that feedback, we adjust um, we adjust the way that we make decisions. Um, so even though RL is inspired by humans, we, we also have some something to learn from it on how to make sequential decisions. Um, <laughs> So yeah, this is the sort of the anatomy of any RL algorithm and any of the uh, algorithms that we discuss sort of fall into, into this framework where um, we run a policy, we fit a model to estimate the reward, and then based on that feedback, we improve our policy. Um, so moving on. Um, so this was sort of a brief intro to RL and how it works. Where does deep learning come in? Why, why do we use deep? Uh, reinforcement learning rather than just classical reinforcement learning. And the power of deep learning comes in its sort of end-to-end ability and it's uh, just like the sheer, uh, express, it's sheer expressive power. Um, so in classical machine learning, we start with an image, we get a bunch of humans to figure out features that are high level. Um, we sort of bu build in the notion of shapes and then from there, after specifying all these features, we can train a classifier that can recognize images. With deep learning, it's an end-to-end -end process. We start from our image, we stack a bunch of layers, and training end-to-end -end using gradient descent, we can immediately arrive at our at the required result. So deep learning has a very, very powerful um, representation ability and expressivity. Um, same with example for robotic learning, where it used to be this whole process of learning, and we augment that with the with the representation ability and sort of uh, efficiency of, of deep learning. And so the huge recent advances in deep learning, advances in reinforcement learning, and just our increased computational power recently, um, it's it's a very promising time to be studying uh, reinforcement learning. Um, so what kinds of tasks does deep RL achieve well? Um, one ta um, cl uh, the classical task is, of course, games. So in environments that are pretty constricted, you have a very specific set of rules. Um, you know, the model is sort of entirely, uh, entirely specified. Um, deep RL does really, really well. Um, and that's the example of Atari games or the example of AlphaGo or you know, training AI agents to play chess. Um, those are all tasks where DeepRL currently really excels. Um, DeepRL also works well in you know, where we want to learn to use sensors to navigate different environments. Um, so some recent applications have been teaching uh, drones to navigate forested areas using DeepRL um, and through processing through ca mounted camera imagery. Um, uh, DeepRL is also good at imitating human experts. If we supply the DeepRL training algorithm with enough data, and it tends to be a vast amount of data, um, it'll eventually learn or be able to imitate sort of the human behavior that we supply it with. And so here's a little fun example of um, a DeepRL model using a variant of, or an algorithm that uses Q-learning to play Super Mario. Um, and it's quite good, as you can see, and it improves with time. Um, so we love to see that. 
Um, here's another example of teaching a robot to walk using reinforcement learning. Oh, sorry about that. Um, so the training takes 6,400 episodes. Um, so deep RL algorithms are very uh, computation expensive. It takes many, many iterations for them to achieve any interesting results at all. So you can see like for the few, first few thousand episodes that our little soap robot uh, kind of struggles to, <laughs> to walk around. Um, it does some, some funny, has some funny poses. Um, eventually though, it, it's, it's, it starts to run. Um, and it's pretty impressive to see. Um, so when does reinforcement learning not do well? Um, well, as we saw from the previous example, it took quite a while for the robot to begin to learn how to use its feet. Um, and in general, deep RL algorithms require millions or billions of iterations to learn anything useful. Um, and this is part of the reason why they're so successful at games, but hard to implement in real applications, is that in games, we have the ability of simulating, of running millions or billions of, of simulations until, you know, to get the necessary amount of data that um, an agent needs to learn. Whereas um, in real life, it could be much more expensive to, uh, to train an agent uh, that, that, that number of times. Um, another challenge is deep RL still requires a lot of human specification. Um, for instance, it's not really trivial to choose the correct reward function. Um, um, so for instance, like in a basketball game, um, the reward function could be just one if your team wins the game and zero if you lose the game. And then you let your agent figure out everything in between. Or you can help lead your agent you know, through the different steps of the game by you know, rewarding them if they dribble correctly. Um, rewarding them if they shoot correctly, or and you know give them a huge reward when they score. Um, so it's not entirely it's it's not determined how we're supposed to to pick a reward function. And in fact, that's probably one of the hardest parts of you know create of creating an RL model is picking the correct reward function that'll you know guide the agent through the through the learning process without entirely constricting their options. So we want to figure out the right balance between leaving the agent some room to explore while also you know guiding them to the correct way uh, or the correct steps to gain rewards along the way. Um, another thing is we don't know how to transfer knowledge between different deep RL models. Um, and a caveat is this is uh, this applies mainly to model free uh, reinforcement learning models. Uh, for model based we do actually know how to use some transfer learning. Um, but this is another one of the open questions in deep RL. Um, so what are the types of RL algorithms? There's, I think they fall into two main types. Um, one is what's called value-based, where we learn to estimate future reward to guide our policy. Um, basically, if I want to know which action to pick now, um, I want to know, based on each action that I could possibly pick, what is my estimated future reward all along the steps. So um, if you're familiar with the butterfly effect, every action can sort of spiral and and, and very bad and and sort of lead to a cascading effect of, of you know future actions. Um, so if uh, if we had some way of knowing uh, what the value is for each action for only the next future step, then we have a very good way of picking uh, of designing our policy so that it's optimal. And the way we model that is through the use of what's called a Q function. Um, and the Q function for a given policy just specifies at any given state action pair in a point in time, what is the expected reward if we continue following that policy? So it's just the sum um, from that point of time until the termination step of the expected reward. Um, and then based on this Q value, um, the val we say the value of the state given this policy is um, the expected value of um, of the Q, the expectation of the Q values um, or the actions that we sample from our policy um, over all the Q values. Um, so given this reformulation, the goal of RL can be rephrased to be the expectation of 
simply the value at the current state. So this helps us sort of reduce the problem recursively to just figuring out what the, or caring about what the value is at the current state. Um, and so this leads us to a very natural algorithm um, to figure out what our policy is by estimating the award sort of through just like classical, you know, Newtonian estimation where we iteratively update our Q value based on each action that we take um, using this sort of really complicated formula. Um, we observe our award, we have a certain learning rate and a discount factor that determines how much we care about uh, cl cl uh, uh, closer decisions rather than decisions that are really far out into the future. Um, and then we improve our estimate of the future value. And so this is what sort of the essence of what's called Q learning is we want to estimate a Q function that'll help us uh, design our policy. Um, and classically, we do it through this iterative updating. Um, another type of our algorithm is, is what's called policy optimization. Um, and what policy optimization does is, uh, or the, uh, the main idea behind it is why do we need to learn this sort of proxy value for our policy or you know learn the value function and then based on that particular action whereas we could simply directly learn the correct policy uh, instead of finding this like proxy value for it um and the basic premise of policy optimization is we have this loss which is the expected uh reward from following a certain policy and we try to uh reduce this loss using uh, a gradient ascent. Um, that's that's the basic essence of it. Um, and I think I, we have time to go super deep into the nuances of each of those types of algorithms. Um, so with that, we can go into a case study. Um, in, so in 2017, NVIDIA uh, made an experiment where they wanted to teach uh, a car to navigate along curved roads. Um, and so like steer, th learn how to steer correctly to avoid obstacles. Um, and the way they did it is pretty interesting in the, uh, uh, in the fact that they actually use supervised learning to create their policy, um, which is not very traditional. Um, so they, um, in their model, they define their states as sort of the input image. They like they fasten a camera to uh, to the car, and based on that, they want to figure out how the car should steer its uh, steer its wheel. Um, and in this case, the cost or the reward; those are basically the same thing. The cost is just the negative reward. Um, the the cost is just the steering error. So how far uh, how far off is the 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 engine being trained? Uh, uh, steering incorrectly compared to how the human did it. Um, and so they hire a bunch of humans and they let them drive the car and they allow them and they collect all that data of steering wheel angles compared to the input image at that moment in time. Um, and what is interesting about this case study is that because um, the data that the data that they collected by letting human drivers drive the car rather than you know, the agent itself that's learning um, is that this leads to what is called off policy training, meaning that the data that you have doesn't follow the policy that you, you're currently learning. Um, and so they offset that in a very clever way using a trick, which is to um, equip the car with a camera facing left and a camera facing right, in addition to the camera facing forward. And based on all three inputs, they can adjust. Uh, they can adjust the car if it detects that it's uh, straying too far left or if it's straying too far right. Um, and so this is what uh, the algorithm sort of looks like. You go from an observation, a picture, you feed it through a neural network, and the output is the action, whether you should uh, steer left or right and at which angle. Um, and in this case, the supervised learning problem directly translates to a policy uh, in the sense that the action that you take is uh, the output of the supervised learning algorithm. Um, and this is an example of the NVIDIA self-driving car. It's going pretty fast, uh, you can see. Um, so this is one 
uh, example from about three years ago. Uh, of course, like self-driving cars is, is one of the biggest applications of deep reinforcement learning right now. Um, and it's sort of the main technique that, that's being used in any sort of uh, uh, self-driving enterprise, self-driving car enterprise. Um, We'll go, um, here's another case study involving a completely different kind of example. Um, this is a, based on a paper called Deep Reinforcement Learning Framework for News Recommendation, where um, the authors have a certain news recommendation site and they want to build an agent that figures out which news articles to recommend to users. Um, so in this case, the state is the user context. Uh, you know, you, you, you receive you, you receive sort of, a, you know, a user uh, profile um, and a user history. And based on that, you want to figure out which action to take, meaning which article, which articles are best to recommend. And they define their award as uh, whether the user clicks or not and some other metrics related to the user's activity, maybe like dwell time uh, or, you know, re revisits, etc. Um, and so it turns out that DeepRL gives a very useful uh, uh, point of attack. Um, you, so you sort of represent, you encode your user context or the state uh, using a vector embedding. Um, and this vector embedding probably includes things like you know, the, the user's profile and their age, in addition to other contextual factors like what articles they've read recently. Um, and then you also encode each of the news items as a vector. Um, and, the, and in this case, in the deep RL uh, framework, we call these actions. Uh, whereas if it were just a deep learning problem, you know, they'd be items or you know, just input vectors. But in this case, they're called actions. Um, and once we have our sort of encoded state, we feed it through what's called a DQN or uh, a deep Q learning network. Um, and this is the true power of deep reinforcement learning compared to normal reinforcement learning as sort of, uh, we don't have to use that old uh, bulky equation, <laughs> if you remember from a few slides ago, um, where we had to like iteratively up, up, uh, update the values based on each state action pair. Um, in this case, the state space is so large because it's, if you think about it, it's the state of all possible users and all possible you know, combinations of articles that they've read. Um, so we don't do any of this. We sort of call our friend the neural network and we let it take care of all, uh, of all the representational aspect of the problem. So we feed it the representation of the state or the, the vector embedding of the state and we feed it through our DQN and we let the DQN output the Q values for each possible action. Um, so that really kind of simplifies the implementation of the algorithm and really leverages the power of neural networks. Um, um, in in uh, a traditional sort of reinforcement learning problem. Um, so this is a very, a very cool use, I think, of of deep reinforcement learning in a very practical application. Uh, um, with that being said, I'll, uh, I'll conclude with a few seconds from the video where Lisa Dole loses to AlphaGo um, in 2016. And you can see he's really upset <laughs> over, oops, you can see that he's really upset over the fact that he's lost. Um, even though it's, it's still pretty impressive because he won a few of the rounds against AlphaGo. Um, even though AlphaGo has had, you know, a few million more trials and training than, than he has as a human. So we shouldn't undersell ourselves as humans. We're still, we're still uh, very efficient learners. Um, but this definitely demonstrates how far, uh, you know, deep reinforcement learning can go and how powerful of a technique it can be. Uh, so, yeah, in conclusion... We covered sort of the, back, the motivation and uh, background behind deep reinforcement learning, why it's a palatable framework. And we discussed two of its of very practical applications that uh, might be in use in the very near future. Um, so yeah, thank you, thank you all very much.
for listening and I'll be handing it off to Mark talking about self-supervised learning. Okay, thanks, Samar. Um, that was very interesting, sort of a lay of the land of reinforcement learning. Um, now we're going to talk about uh, self-supervised learning, which is a pretty different uh, paradigm. Um, in fact, there are many different paradigms of machine learning. Uh, that we'll briefly touch on in this talk. Um, in addition to self-supervised learning, there's uh, supervised learning and unsupervised learning. Um, so supervised learning is basically you're given a data set where um, your input data are labeled. So you have input data XI, as we can see here. Um, and associated labels yi and your goal is to estimate a function f that maps input data to output data y okay um fairly simple uh definition here but the applications are endless um so one of the most uh basic examples is uh a spam filter so you're given an email arrives uh, not yet in your inbox, but uh, you know, like uh, Gmail obtains an email from some, you know, any old uh, uh, sender, and they want to determine whether that email is spam or should go in your inbox. Um, so you can use a number of uh, features to basically classify an email as spam. For example, they might be um, advertising Viagra or uh, maybe they don't mention your name in, in, the, um, in the email. Things like that. And so each email is like one data point and um, to train, to, to basically uh, train this, this spam filter um, you have to have some ground truth examples of um, good emails that are spam and emails that are not spam. And the emails that are spam uh, will have certain characteristics that differ from the um, non-spam emails that will allow our um, classifier to um, identify them. So um, another very uh, common example is uh, ordinary least squares regression. So it turns out linear trends uh, appear quite frequently uh, in the sciences, um, in the industry, um, and we often want to fit uh, a best al align to that data. So um, Basically, um, we can use this um, to basically predict um, the new data points on that line, right? So uh, in this two-dimensional case, we're going to have a slope and a y-intercept. And if so uh, x in this case would be the horizontal axis um, dimension and then y would be the vertical axis dimension and so if you're only given the x dimension then you can use this line to estimate what y will be 
and you can get a pretty good estimate if if the trend is linear. Um, so perhaps also the most basic example of uh, supervised learning. And um, moving on to a much more sophisticated example of um, <clears throat> object detection. So this model is called Mask RCNN. Uh, it was developed fairly recently at Facebook. And it enables you to um, detect various objects in an image. So here you can see we have um, successfully uh, detected several people as well as the bikes that they're riding. And that's pretty much the only objects in this scene. There's a tree in the background, but um, yeah, maybe we don't have to count that. And so uh, here, the X's, i.e. the inputs, are images. And we do a lot of sophisticated processing of these images using what are called uh, convolutional filters. Uh, and eventually, this uh, processed representation reaches what's called the head of the model, where we have uh, basically three types of inputs. One is the class. So is the object a person? Is it a bike? Is it a cow? Uh, you know, is it a dog? Uh, the second item being a box that encapsulates that object. So we see there's a sort of dim rectangle enclosing each object. Um, and then the third output is the mask. The mask is the pixel. Basically, um, you take every pixel in the image and it's either going to be on if it corresponds to that image or sorry, that object, or off if it doesn't. And so these three outputs combined form the output Y of, of our um, object detection model. So this is supervised learning. We have inputs and labeled outputs. Um, unsupervised learning, we basically, we don't have labels. All we have is raw data. And the best we can do here is, well, not quite the best. We'll see su self-supervised learning will give us some additional tools. But um, one thing we can try is to basically find a latent structure that explains uh, our observations x. So you know, you start out with just a bunch of uh, data points, right? And maybe there's some underlying structure um, behind that data. So let's take a look at this first example here. Um, notice these points on this 2D plane. Uh, they roughly form a line. So um, this isn't to be confused with least squares in the previous slide. But um, we basically have uh, data XIs that live in a two-dimensional space but intrinsically, they really belong in this one-dimensional linear subspace, um, or well, subset uh, of the uh, of X, the the observation space. And PCA, uh, principal components analysis, is a way to project each point onto this low-dimensional space. So. Um, Basically, you can, uh, yeah, have a, a simpler, like, representation uh, of the data. And this sort of uh, protrusion into this second dimension can just be uh, dismissed as, as noise. And so you can just throw out uh, that dimension effectively. Um, PCA is, is widely used for, like, exploratory data analysis. Um, uh, it's used for an application called dimensionality reduction, where let's say you have a very high dimensional representation, then you can uh, map that to a low dimensional representation and still retain most of the information of, of that data. Um, moving on to another example of unsupervised learning uh, is cluster analysis. So um, notice here, um, it's a little more obvious that these data points are colored 
But even if they weren't colored, like let's say they're all black, we notice that there's some structure here, right? Like there's a, definitely a cluster in this top left corner, definitely a cluster like towards the middle where the blue is, and then another cluster towards the bottom. And so um, there is a variety of unsupervised learning methods such as k-means, um, um, Gaussian mixture models, Dirichlet processes that can be used to basically estimate these cluster, not only the, the locations of the clusters, but basically how the clusters are shaped. So if you use a Gaussian mixture model, for example, you can model the sort of elongations of each cluster. Um, so, yeah, so maybe, for example, each cluster corresponds to uh, a different, you know, animal, if you have images of animals. So the red might be dogs, blue might be cats, and green might be, uh, like, mice or something like that. Um, the third example here is an um, example that is important for sequential data such as stock prices, weather forecasting. So here, each x is the state at a specific point in time. So um, then at the next point in time, um, you know, the, the state will change a little bit and you basically have uh, the state that's evolving over time with a temporal dependence. So this structure here, is called a hidden Markov model structure where you assume that there is a hidden sort of uh, state that's evolving over time and that state emits an observation at each time step, a noisy ob observation at each time step. So um, again, you know, these uh, the hidden Markov models are widely used in like Let's say you have uh, some text and you're trying to label the parts of speech. Um, if the x's are uh, continuous, i.e. like vector valued, then um, you can do weather forecasting, climate modeling, uh, modeling stock prices, basically anything that has trends that evolve over time. All right. Moving on to the um, centerpiece of this talk, um, let's try to concretely define what self-supervised learning is first. So you basically have an underlying set of data, these XIs, they live in a space X, and the input-output pairs basically have some kind of uh, function that maps that X to a new value. And your goal now is to find an f that maps uh, i of x to o of x. So this is a fairly uh, abstract um, definition. Um, we'll see later some very, in fact, right now, we'll see a very concrete example of like what i and o can be. Um, but before we do that, let's kind of interpret this a little bit. Um, so basically, you're starting out with unlabeled data, right? But you're applying a transportation, sorry, a, a transformation uh, to the data to basically generate these input output pairs where you can now uh, use, you know, one of many powerful uh, supervised learning methods. Uh, we just saw earlier that it can be used for object detection or image classification, uh, in which case we have like superhuman, you know, classification accuracy. Um, so this allows us to leverage supervised methods, basically. Um, so what is an example of like an input or output uh, mapping? Well, let's just say we have a sequence of words, okay, and we just want to predict the last word in that sentence. So in this case, the input will be 
uh, a sequence of all but the last word, and then the output will be the last word. So we just want to find a function f that maps this partial sequence to the last uh, word in, in this sequence. Um, and we'll cover a couple more examples to, uh, yeah, just for concreteness. So let's talk about um, autoencoders. So an autoencoder basically takes uh, an input. It can be uh, an image. It can be just a arbitrary vector of data. And it compresses that uh, input via an encoding function. So in this uh, diagram, we can see our encoding function is just it has a, we have one basically uh, hidden layer, and then that hidden layer is mapped to um, our latent uh, code. So once the uh, input is encoded, we then decode it again using uh, you know like this can either be a convolutional layer or a um, multi-layer uh, perceptron layer and map it back to an output and um, depending on the application we want this output to match the input as much as possible so in other words the input mapping and the output mapping are just the the input itself X um, so um, why is this useful? Well, if we go back to the example of uh, dimensionality reduction with principal components analysis, um, you know, this can be used for uh, exploratory data analysis. Uh, it can be used for like uh, image compression. Um, basically, like, yeah, you, you end up with like a, a compressed representation of the input. Um, and with these standard plain autoencoders, uh, we're not doing anything fancy yet. So to uh, learn this function f, we're just going to minimize uh, the Euclidean distance between the input and the output. Pretty simple. Um, the problem with that is um, so if we take the example of MNIST where we have handwritten digits um, we're gonna have some training set right where we train this model and um, the training set we would expect to perform fine because the model has already seen that data but with the test set we're gonna not be able to reconstruct those images um, and the reason being that um, essentially our model is overfitting. It, it fails to interpolate uh, between examples. And so um, how do we reconcile that? Well, uh, there's a slightly more sophisticated um, model called variational autoencoders. Now, instead of just mapping to a uh, deterministic latent space, our encoder produces uh, the parameters of a normal distribution. So this normal distribution is going to have some uh, mean, mu x, and some, uh, some variance, right? In the multi-dimensional case, it's going to have a covariance matrix. And we then use these parameters to sample from this distribution and um, then decode that sample to get our uh, reconstructed input, x hat here. Um, so um, we can't just choose any old parameters mu and sigma here, right? Uh, we want to estimate these parameters and so um, the technique is to basically 
use the same loss function as before, but then regularize with what's called the callback Leibler divergence. And this is a, um, it's not a distance metric per se, but um, it's effectively measuring the distance between these two distributions here. So the um, callback Leibler divergence between our input and just the standard normal Gaussian. And so this is going to uh, basically um, smooth out uh, this distribution and make sure that we can sample um, broadly in this uh, intermediary um, distribution uh, space. Um, so, yeah, that's it for variational autoencoders. Um, input and output are both just uh, the input itself but we're doing this intermediate sort of compression and uh, counting on the input to have a lot of redundancy that we can compress away in our um, in our code. Um, so now let's move on to another uh, widely popular self-supervised learning model called BERT. Um, so BERT is basically a general purpose uh, natural language processing uh, model that um, came out maybe a year, year and a half ago and basically achieves state-of-the-art uh, results in a number of actually 11 different uh, language tasks such as question answering. So let's say you give BERT a question, it will answer that question to the best of its abilities that, you know, with whatever data it's been trained with. Um, passage comprehension. So you provide it with a, an entire passage, um, you know, like maybe uh, a piece of prose or maybe a piece of fiction or something, and then you ask it a question about that passage. Um, next sentence completion. So you give it a sentence and then you want to predict what sentence occurs after that. Um, so you might notice there's kind of this uh, symmetry here, or you have like uh, two parts to each one of these. You have the question and answer, the passage, and then the question about the passage, the first sentence, and then the next sentence. Uh, that's not a coincidence. We'll see more about that a little later. But first, uh, before we like uh, talk like about BERT and like uh, its specifics, um, really, uh, BERT wouldn't be possible without this essential uh, component called the transformer. Uh, in fact, this left module here is the encoder of the transformer, and that's really all that's used for BERT. In fact, that's kind of all BERT really is. is this kind of stacked really high. Um, so let's just um, talk about the transformer and that'll give us a little bit of intuition about BERT. So transformer was uh, designed with the goal of solving the problem of transduction. In other words, uh, transforming one sentence into, in, transforming a sentence into another, sorry, transforming a sequence into another sequence. For example, we have a sequence of words in French here, and we want to translate that into English. Um, so, again, uh, that's not necessarily what Bert is addressing, but we'll get to that later. Um, let's just go over exactly uh, how the transformer um, produces this translation. So you start out with the entire uh, input sequence, including the start token and the end token, which um, basically are just additional symbols that uh, the model will learn representations for. So um, conveniently, uh, we can pass in this entire sequence 
in one fell swoop. But in order to do that, we need a positional encoding. So a positional encoding is basically a collection of uh, sinusoidal waves of varying frequencies that allow you to uh, identify at which part of the sentence the token uh, like belongs. So um, you basically just add a positional encoding for each token. Uh, for each token, it's going to be different. And then you're ready to pass that into what's called the multi-headed attention module. Um, so this is, uh, yeah, basically a, a module within a module that um, we'll go into more detail later. But this is basically, uh, this self-attention uh, module is basically what uh, allows the transformer to um, do what it does. So um, before we go into detail about that, um, let's just go over the rest of this architecture at a high level. So once this passes through an attention module, we uh, basically have a residual connection and a batch normalization, and that's passed to a feed forward uh, network where we again have a residual uh, connection. And then this output is passed to the decoder to the uh, attention module of the decoder. Um, so this, in total, the transformer has basically two sets of inputs. This uh, input sequence, and then this output sequence of tokens. So we need both in order to generate the, uh, the output um, token. So the first token we get for free, the start token, sentences always start with the start token so we get that for free now that we have both the input sequence and the start token this also goes through um, a positional encoding uh, multi-headed attention and then it's combined with the um, the input sequence into this attention this third attention module then finally we pass it through another feed forward and then a dense layer and a soft max, and we get our uh, prediction. So this transformer is saying the first word of the sentence is the. So we can see the sort of analogous article in French, le, is, uh, you know, it's not too surprising. So now we concatenate that to our uh, output tokens. So now our output contains both start and the. And we basically uh, repeat, uh, rinse and repeat. So we take this input sequence again, pass it through our encoder. Now we're passing in not just the start token, but start and the. And this goes all the way through. It's combined with the encoding. And our new estimate is ball. So ball is the second word of the sentence. And um, you get the idea. We just keep going until, so now it predicts the word the is and red. And we keep going until we get an end token. And that's our sentence. Uh, the ball is red. Okay. Um, that was kind of a, you know, a lot to uh, grasp, but you really just need to focus on this encoding part to understand BERT. So we're going to dive into this uh, attention module. So the attention module, uh, basically for each uh, word, so first you have to uh, cre uh, map the word to an embedding space, right? Using a, a vector, vector um, like a word to vec type of operation. Um, and once you have a word embedding X, we produce three um, vectors. Uh, a query using this uh, matrix WQ, a key WK using WK, and then a value WV. So now we have a query, a key, and a value associated with this word uh, whose vector representation is X. And we take all of the queries, keys, and values of our input sentence 
So remember, this is for the input uh, sequence that pa is passed to the encoding. Uh, we pack these together into matrices and produce an output, which is the attention of the basically your input sequence. So what is the attention? Well, for each query word, you're going to have basically a linear combination of uh, values here. So each value corresponds to some word in the input sequence. And whichever one is represented the most means that the model is attending to that word the most. And uh, that's basically it. Um, so the attention module is, is incredibly important. Uh, it's you know used uh, not just in language modeling, but um, reinforcement learning, um, any type of sequence modeling really. Um, it's analogous to convolutional layers in uh, image classification if you have studied that. So um, now that we understand the attention module, uh, let's go back to BERT. So as I mentioned, uh, BERT is fairly simple architecture, at least compared to the transformer. Uh, it's just a stack of these multi-headed attention uh, uh, modules. And then we just have a dense layer and a softmax at the end where we output probabilities um, associated with the output uh, desired output sequence. So why is this a, a self-supervised learning model? Well, we can see it fits our definition here, where given some input x, we first create an input. Uh, we take our input mapping. And note, this is like a noisy mapping because we do random masking. But uh, th this is basically how you uh, do what's called the, the pre-training stage for BERT is you take the input sequence or sorry you take the original sequence and you mask part of it so you want BERT to predict what these uh, words are so uh, in other words you want it to replace this first mask token with ball and replace the second one with red so the desired output here is just the original input um, and um, so, yeah, let's talk more about pre-training, and uh, the next stage would be fine-tuning. So, um, this uh, process of masking a sentence is uh, called the close task. Um, if you've ever played the game Mad Libs, where you have like a, you know, like a, like a, a passage with miss blank words, and you fill in the blanks with like silly things. This is the exact same thing, uh, except we don't fill it with silly things, we fill it with meaningful things. Um, so the uh, closed task, you can either um, mask a single sentence or uh, consecutive sentence pairs. So in other words, like if you have like a, a book or something, you're going to have sentences that follow one another, and you can uh, pass in a pair of sentences that occur consecutively uh, to BERT during pre-training. And so, yeah, we mask a random uh, subset of, of the words in that sequence. Um, and um, also with some probability, we'll just, instead of masking, we'll swap it with like a random word. But we don't need to go into those details. Um, so in terms of the like exact structure of an input sequence, uh, it always be begins with this CLS token. So um, yeah, like regardless of if the input is one sentence or two sentences, it's always going to start with a CLS token. And then it can be followed by any number of uh, word tokens. So for each word in the vocabulary, you're going to have um, a separate token, right? And once you finish the sentence, you end it with a separating, t a separating token sep here. So um, let's say you 
only want one sentence in your input, it'll start with the CLS token, have some number of word tokens in between, and then end with a single SEP token. If you wanted two sentences, then following that first SEP token, you'd have additional word tokens, and then you'd end it with one last uh, SEP token. So that's the expected input to BERT. Um, by the way, uh, those intermediate tokens aren't necessarily word tokens, right? They can be mask tokens if we're doing training, for example. Um, so, yeah. Um, uh, before we talk about fine-tuning, let's just emphasize we are training BERT to replace the mask tokens with um, the actual words that appear in that sentence. Um, and we're, you know, expecting it to generalize uh, to new sentences, soaking up, you know, patterns um, in that input data set. Um, so now, um, that's, this is all called the pre-training stage for BERT. Um, if we want to now use BERT for some application like we mentioned earlier, question answering, um, next sentence prediction, etc. Um, we actually use the exact same architecture um, as before, uh, but now the inputs are going to look slightly different. So um, if you recall uh, the comment I made earlier, um, the sequences are going to be um, basically either one sentence or two sentences, right? Well, during fine-tuning, uh, the input is going to always be uh, two sequences, <coughs> so or two sentences. So the first sentence will be unmasked, and the second sentence is completely masked. Um, and so now instead of randomly dispersing the max tokens, we are explicitly masking the senten second sentence and the first sentence is completely unmasked. Um, one note about fine-tuning, like what does that... So uh, this is sort of a cu cultural term. Uh, so we're not quite like, you know, f uh, turning, like, you know, tweaking parameters in our model or anything like that. Uh, Fine-tuning has a very specific meaning that originates in uh, image classification where typically you would train on, an, on a huge image data set such as ImageNet, but you want your image classifier to um, basically generalize to like some niche group of images. So maybe like very specific breeds of dogs or Maybe you want to do face classification. Um, so you basically chop off the top layer of the model and uh, replace it with a new layer that you that contains uh, one index per uh, new uh, object that you want to classify. Um, so that, that's a little bit of a um, digression, but uh, it's important to kind of yeah, know where these terms come from. Um, so yeah, going back to fine-tuning, the first sentence is unmasked, second sentence is completely masked. And depending on what the task is, we're going to strategically choose what those uh, sentence pairs are. Um, that's pretty much it. So um, I hope you take away from this talk uh, basically what su self-supervised learning is all about. Uh, it basically takes um, unlabeled data and it sort of uh, spoofs labels so that you can use very powerful supervised methods on unlabeled data. Um, this is especially, um, yeah. Um, so these self-supervised learning models uh, achieve state-of-the-art performance on a variety of tasks such as uh, dimensionality reduction, um, uh, natural language tasks, 
And um, so, yeah, if you're ever like interested in doing some modeling, um, consider using a self-supervised uh, approach, especially if you uh, don't have labeled data or uh, it's just too difficult to, to label the data. Um, so thank you all for coming. Um, uh, I'll answer your questions in the chat. Thank you.